it's Friday once again, and this week we're going to talk about roughing strategies inside of Fusion 360. As most of you know, you have things like a pocket clearing versus an adaptive clearing. However, we're going to dive into the scenarios where you may choose one over the other or why one is going to be a better option based on what you're doing. Let's go ahead and jump into it and see how this goes. So here's my first part. I've already got my setup created with stock that's a little oversized and my XYZ position placed. That said, let's go ahead and jump into a couple of different roughing strategies. For the sake of everything in this video, it doesn't matter if you're choosing 2D or 3D. I highly recommend always going for the 3D roughing, in my opinion, because it is model aware versus me having to define stuff. So let's start with the basics of an adaptive clearing toolpath. And with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and do, as our other video says, just hit OK and then let the software walk me through the process. So in this case, it's telling me right out the start, I don't have a tool selected. So now that we've done an adaptive clearing, let's go back and do a pocket clearing so that we have a very clean idea of which strategy is doing what. I'm actually going to make one adjustment to that tool path because it's thinking about a bounding box when we actually want no boundary at all. Or we could also turn on our stock boundaries at the end of the day. So now looking at these two, the way they work right out the start is our first tool path is going to actually go extremely deep to our maximum step down. And it's actually going to use the shoulder of our tool, as I like to say. Again, I personally like to say adaptive clearing tends to be kind of like a weed whacker. You know, you don't use the full width of the weed whacker. You only use a portion of that weed whacker. But you could actually go in and take down very tall grass or weeds if that's the case. Now, that's the first thing most people notice is we're going extremely deep and then we're actually going to work our way back up and then go deep again and work our way back up. We'll see that more here in a moment in another part. So now on the pocket clearing side of things, this is going to actually use the full width of our tool or as by default, 90 to 95% unless you adjust it. So that being said is I like to say pocket clearing, although people think because it says pocket, it's meant for pocket. It actually works really well for just about any scenario. That being said is pocket clearing, in my opinion, is like the lawnmower. The lawnmower is a full mower deck width of cut, very shallow kind of step downs. And we're seeing that again here. So we're making shallow step downs. and We're basically constantly dropping Z down in our part versus as we've saw it in adaptive clearing where we go deep and then work our way back up. So again, both options are very suffice for a lot of things. Now that we've seen it in the Z-axis method, we can actually look in the XY method. So this is where we start to see one toolpath dramatically different than the other toolpath. In that case, adaptive clearing is actually using a lot of arcs to go around this part. So one thing I could do here is I'm going to turn on these points and kind of show you the data points of the toolpath, right? Every one of these little black dots on my screen are an actual change in direction in the X, Y, or Z, which creates that point at the end of the day. So if you have an older machine, it could actually data starve on a tool path like this. However, with the optimal load set, in the case of our tool, it's always trying to get to that maximum optimal load, step over or radial engagement, depending on what terminology you like to use. And then from that, make the most efficient cycle possible around our part. Again, if we look at the actual pocket clearing toolpath, you're going to notice this is much more straight line and linear as well. The file size in itself will be a smaller amount of data. However, we're doing a lot more step downs, but by a layer by layer basis, it will actually be less points and allowing your machine again on those older machines to run much faster in linear lines. Again, I haven't adjusted any of my tolerances here. So as all of you can see, Everything is set to default. We could go back and fix it. They both also use kind of a ramp style entry in internal pockets. Again, the difference here is we're burying this tool all the way down to a maximum step down and then working our way back up. So let's jump over to another part and see a little different scenario where you may want to actually choose pocket over adaptive. And in the case of this part, I would have adaptive cleared it, but that's just me. So now we have our second part. This tends to be kind of like a male mold cavity. That being said is let's go ahead and apply our same kind of strategies here. Again, we're going to go adaptive clearing. I'm going to use a half inch flat end mill as you've seen me before. 
And for the sake of this video, I'm actually going to adjust my roughing step down to one inch so that my fine step down is 100 thou. So as that's calculating, we'll go back and we're going to do a pocket clearing now. And on our pocket clearing, we're going to switch out actually to a much larger tool. So this is a two inch kind of insert mill. I'm going to say no boundary. We're going to go ahead and use stock to define starting outside of our part. And then lastly, our maximum roughing step down is going to be 100 thou. So again, very straight line. There's some rapids and linking moves to the corners. That's what you're seeing here with the green. So now when we compare the two from a time study, granted my speeds and feeds aren't correct, and I wouldn't base this off that without having speeds and feeds, but that one inch or that half inch end mill is going extremely deep and removing, if you think about it, all this material with one pass. Now, when we look at our pocket clearing, we're actually removing that material each time we step down. Again, in the world of pocket clearing, we're going down a set amount each time round. Adaptive clearing, we're going actually to an extreme depth and then working our way back up to clear out material. So on a part like this, what we're starting to see is adaptive clearing might actually be a better choice with that half inch end mill. Where we're going to start to fail, we're going to see this on another part, is a half inch end mill can only go so deep before you get extreme deflection. Or another rule of thumb is, is the amount of torque on your machine. So again, based on the differences between the tools, it will actually create a lot of up pressure on the spindle. Adaptive clearing will create a lot of horizontal pressure on a spindle. With the torque settings on your machine, also older Fidal's 10, 15 horsepower motors they don't have a ton of torque to actually be able to fully use a tool for adaptive clearing. And we'll see that here in a minute when we jump up from, say, a half-inch end mill to maybe a one-inch end mill on our next part. So here we are with our next part. We have our mudguard, or, yeah, our mudguard mold tooling. Um, that being said is we're going to start actually with a pocket clearing strategy. And this time I'm going to go ahead and utilize my two-inch cutter. And you're going to notice this two inch cutter basically has an extension that sticks it out quite a bit more so that we could get all the way down in that pocket. I'm going to just base everything off this little containment boundary right here. And again, is I'm going to use stock also so that the software doesn't waste time machining anywhere outside of that. And with that, let's go ahead and plug in that 0.1 step down. So as you can see, we're coming into that part. We're starting out a little further, working our way in and roughing everything out. So again, not the best of tool paths to start with. We could clean this up more if we really wanted to. But as you can see right now, we actually are just roughing everything out of that pocket. So now if we were to look at this from an adaptive clearing standpoint, and again, maybe we actually stay with that two inch face mill. Nah, I'm not gonna do that actually. We're gonna go ahead and swap this out for a much larger end mill. So as you can see here, we have a three quarter inch end mill and that three quarter inch end mill. Again, we're going to base everything off machining our part as is. We don't actually want rest machining. Usually you would want rest machining. We don't want it because we're just comparing the two. So again, we're going to do an inch and an eighth followed up by 10% for working our way back up. So now when we start to look at this mold, that is a three quarter inch tool sticking out more than probably five times the diameter, which again, we're starting to worry about deflection and issues of that nature. So from a time study standpoint, I will actually go in and I will adjust this one because it's extremely slow. Let's say we're working with a 10,000 RPM machine and we're actually gonna be running this tool upwards of probably 175 inches at the end of the day. So as you can see, my cycle time has actually dramatically reduced and actually beat out that adaptive clearing, all while also retaining rigidity in my tool versus having a very thin tool sticking out a long distance. And again here, I do have to worry about rubbing the shank unless I have a relief shank kind of tool. So, that comp so this is our kind of last and final part to talk through and kind of do a little bit of work with. This time we're working with kind of a female mold cavity. So just like you've seen me do a couple of times already, we're just going to go ahead and throw some tools at this. Again, that's my two inch face mill, but we don't want to use that for adaptive. Let's say we go in with our half inch cutter, as you've seen a couple of times, and I'm not going to play with the step down and step over. 
So now again, look how tiny this tool is in scale to our part. And that being said, we're going to go back and of course, we're going to do our pocket clearing. And let's just say we're going with that two inch tool, right? So again, based on what we have going on, one of these strategies is probably going to work out a lot better. I would also say in the world of these tool paths, give me a quick second here. We're going to give this a boundary so that we stay with inside of versus the outside of. We're going to actually see that we could start to have problems the deeper we go with chip evacuation, regardless of what tool path we actually pick at this point. I also have a firm belief that I don't think one is right or wrong on any of these parts. And I leave that up to all of you to decide. However, in my experience of doing molds and things of that nature, we always tend to lean more on pocket clearing versus adaptive clearing. And the reasons for that was, is one, the chip is much smaller and maintainable. We can run a tool dramatically faster with a smaller bite. And for those of you that don't know, there is a optimal tool load in some cases, but if you reduce your optimal load, you can actually increase your feed rate, especially in roughing, because we're not too concerned about the actual surface finish. So this would be a great tool for anybody and everybody is to kind of look at the differences between the two when you program your part. And again, in my opinion, if we go back to that simple enclosure, I would adaptive clear what I would call my thinner parts all day, every day. I love a half inch end mill more than anybody. I got an inch and a quarter flute length usually from default. So anytime my part kind of allows me to go in an inch and a quarter, I love to run a one inch end mill. Again, outside profiles of even my parts. I may outside profile some of these other parts based on an end mill and then come in with an insert mill and rough out the inside. So again, personal opinion, there's a scenario for everybody and anywhere and everywhere. That's also not to say that you can't use an end mill as pocket clearing, and you could always use an insert mill for adaptive clearing, and that comes down to your machine and knowing its capabilities. But I think if all of you try this, you're going to get a good kick out of it. And you're going to understand that there's going to be scenarios where you could use both tool paths with rest machining even. That said, it's Friday, guys. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Another week is done. Let's get back to it after a long weekend and put these things to the test.